Hey Church Online, this is Pastor Lise. I'm the youth pastor here at the Campus Church and we're so glad that you guys are joining us online. If you are looking for ways to get connected with our church in any capacity, we actually have an email link that's gonna be shown right below, but please reach out with your prayer requests, with opportunities to get involved more, and we'd love to connect with you. As well, we would love to join with you in a time of worship now. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've sown your breath, sing my own song. Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent. The shackles I wear But on my own Scarless sins Had a crimson cost You nailed my death To that old rugged cross An empty slave At the end see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes a wide open tomb where there should be a casket the children are singing and dancing and laughing the father is welcoming this is our homecoming roses in bloom pushed up from the embers rivers of
Here at the Campus Church, we have seen God do some really incredible things uh, through each of our congregations, and now we're also excited about our Campus Church Online. Part of this is obviously uh, taking our tithes and offering and following the command that God has given us uh, in His Word, and all the funds that come into this place go right back into making ministry happen, including Campus Online and our youth programming and our kids' ministry. We're so grateful what God is going to do, but if you are looking to get involved with um, partnering with us financially, there's going to be a link below that's going to give you some more information on how you can do that. But first, let me pray over this offering and what God is going to do through it. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, continually with all that you have given us and blessed us with. But Lord, we just always pray that when we come into a space of tithes and offering, Lord, may it be used for your kingdom glory alone. May it not be for our own self-service, but God, may it all be used back for you and you alone. We thank you and we praise you in everything in your name. Amen. Uh... Anyway, so I'm Zach. Once again, I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to church this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing our series now and then from the book of Judges. We're going to dive into one of the more fascinating and dramatic stories actually in the entirety of the Bible, uh, the life of Samson. Uh, now, when I was a kid, I remember being told this story in Sunday school or in kids' church, and I remember my dad, he was really into going to the gym at that time. He was in his you know, late 20s, early 30s, and I was just a little kid, and he had this like tank top that said Samson's gym on it, and it was a picture of Samson like pulling down the pillars, going to the gym. Uh, it was a different time back then, but that's what I think of every time when I think about this story. Um, now, you may remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the story of Othniel. Who remembers that? Who was here for our Othniel uh, week? We called him the no drama judge. Uh, you know, his story was short. It was tidy. It was one of legacy, operating in God's power. Well, Samson is quite the opposite. Uh, this story tells more like The Bachelor or maybe even Love is Blind if you watch that show. Uh, and if you don't know the story yet, in a little while you'll clue into why that was really, really funny, what I just said. Um, but Samson's story is found in Judges 13 to 16. And we're going to cover a lot of ground today together uh, over the next 30 minutes uh, or so. Uh, now this story, it's, it's a hard one. It's one that pastors don't usually pick because it's not as straightforward. It's not a go-to uh, if you will, it's a story of strength and weakness, triumph and tragedy, and ultimately the sovereignty of God working through a flawed individual. You know, Samson's life offers us this profound lesson about purpose and obedience and the consequences of our choices. And it also reminds us of the grace and the power of God to redeem even the most broken situations. So now before we dive in together, I want to preface, preface sorry, that the details in this story 
are often debated. We're, you're going to see why when we start to dive into some of the specifics. It's, it's quite a wild depiction of this man's life. Uh, and, but mostly it's debated because it's difficult for us to understand in Western culture. There's really a few different views on this story and some others in the Old Testament. In case you're wondering, the AGC, the association that our church belongs to, would claim to a literal translation of Scripture, just so we're clear this morning. And many scholars would argue that Samson's story may have a basis in historical reality, and even if the narrative includes legendary or symbolic elements, it's still very valid and the truths to it are valid. For example, the setting of Samson's story aligns with Histor- a historical period of the Philistines' dominance over Israel, okay? Now, there's archaeological evidence that supports the existence of the Philistine settlement in Gaza and Ashkelon and Ekron and all those places which play a role in this whole narrative that we read in the Bible. There's also talk about tribal conflict, Samson's individual exploits against the Philistines, which we're going to read about uh, a little bit later. Uh, they reflect this kind of guerrilla-style resistance of these small tribes or these individuals that might have engaged in during that time. And actually, in modern day, excavations have uncovered evidence of Philistine culture, including their cities, weapons, worship of deities like Dagon, mentioned in this exact story. Then we look at the temple architecture, and archaeologists discovered of these Philistine temples with central pillars suggested that collapsed uh, from such structures, just as this is described in Judges 16. It is archaeologically possible. Some would argue that the, uh, the purpose of Samson's story originated as, as part of Israel's oral tradition and was later written down and maybe even embellished. Uh, but they would say that Samson may represent a real tribal leader or warrior whose deeds were mi- uh, mythologized over generations, kind of incorporating symbolic and moral elements to make the story more impactful. But even among those who question the literal history of this story, scholars highlight its theological and symbolic truths. They would claim that these theological truths over literal details, and, and many, many theologians argue that the Bible's primary purpose is to convey these spiritual truths over and over again. So thus, even if the elements of Samson's story are symbolic or convey, and even if you believe this, the truths still exist and they're still the same. Finally, many other scholars adopt kind of a middle to this where some of it probably happened, but other stuff may have been embellished as it was passed down over the years. But ultimately, whether viewed as history, legend, or a combination of both, the story of Samson remains a powerful narrative that resonates with themes of human failure, purpose, and redemption. Amen? Yes, good. But again, our stance as a church would be under the umbrella of a literal translation this morning. Our God is a big God who stands outside of time and created the world. And even if some of us may not uh, see someone with the strength of Samson or cutting hair, altering our, altering our power, it doesn't mean that our God couldn't absolutely do it. Amen? There are very dramatic events within Scripture, and I know for myself and many of you in this room, you've seen the unexplainable. And now this morning, we aren't diving into the historical accuracy any more than we already have. But like we already said, this story serves as a launch pad for important spiritual truth for us now, just as it did for the people then. So if you have a Bible with you in any format this morning, you can open up to Judges chapter 13. Uh, and we're going to highlight some important parts of this story. Uh, and we're going to cover a lot of ground in the life of Samson. Uh, but this opening verses, we are told about Samson's birth parents in this opening chapter, chapter 13. Verse 1, it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, just quickly, this has been a common theme in the book of Judges. And if you're new with us, I encourage you to head back on our YouTube uh, channel and check out as we dive deeper into that specific theme over previous messages over the last few weeks. Excuse me. But the Coles notes is God delivered Israel from the hands of their oppressors. But over and over again, Israel rejects God. And as time passes and they participate in some truly horrific rituals, and God allows them to experience the consequences of their choices. And each time Israel would realize the error of their ways, they would cry out to God and God would give them a judge or a deliverer. Today we're going to be talking about Samson that would come in and save them from their oppression. And then typically they would experience a period of peace, a period of relief, a period uh, of a number of years where they were not being oppressed. First, we're going to look at this calling of Samson in chapter 13, a life set apart. Now, uh, back to Samson's parents. It says in verse 3, the angel of the Lord appeared to her, Samson's mother, and said, you are barren and childless. 
but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. No, no, I'm not a Nazarite. I just don't, I like my hair long. Dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. This is incredible. An angel of the Lord appears to her and uh, changes her life, essentially. Imagine that, like, yo, honey, change of plans. <laughs> Imagine you're going home, you're like, I have something to tell you. But this angel says that he's going to dedicate to God, that, sorry, Samson is going to be dedicated to God as a Nazarite. And what that is, is it is an Israelite that is consecrated to the service of God under vows to abstain from alcohol, let their hair grow, and avoid defilement by contact with corpses or anything dead. And this is a huge honor and a huge calling on someone's life, especially to be chosen by God or an angel to come to your mom and be like, by the way, this is going to happen. This is incredible. It continues in verse 24. It says, the woman gave birth to the boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. So we see here that Samson was called with a purpose just as Samson was called to be the deliverer of Israel. Each of us in our own 2024 selves right now were created with a divine purpose given to us by God. And it might not be to fight a thousand Philistines, although I hope not because I would probably lose. No, I would definitely lose. But uh, Jeremiah 1 in the Bible reminds us that God knows us even before we are born. And has plans for our lives. But just as we read here, being set apart for God requires discipline, obedience, faithfulness. And we're going to expand on this as we look at Samson's life. So I encourage you as well to read these stories in their entirety. If you have time this week or in your devotions, read these three chapters. Because there's some really, really wild stuff. And and if you have questions, call me. Because I really nerded out about it these last couple weeks. I'd love to talk to you about it. But flipping over to chapter 14, if you have a Bible with you once again, we see Samson does what most young guys do or at least want to do. He finds himself a wife. Okay, But there's a catch. Verse 14, 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and he saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman. Now get her for me as my wife. Different time. His father and mother replied, isn't there another acceptable woman, right? This, she's a Philistine. It's kind of a burn, but she's a Philistine, right? You, you can imagine the tension there. You can imagine how that conversation went even with his parents. I'm like, are you sure this one? Uh, but Samson said to his father, nope, Get her for me. She's the right one. I know it. Does that sound familiar for any, like, you know, young adult guy? No, I know it. She's the one. That one. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. (laughs) Doesn't Samson just know everything? Right? You see, Israelites, they weren't to intermarry with other groups at this time, especially their oppressors for obvious reasons. They worshipped other gods. They had other cultural distinctives, rituals that would only lead to incredible chaos, destruction, and hurt for everybody involved. And we're going to read about the consequences of this decision together. But it continues in verse 5. It says, As Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother, as they approached the vineyards, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward them. Terrifying. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. That is awesome. And someone should make a movie about it. Who needs Yellowstone, right, when you have the Bible? But then he went, it says in verse 7, then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. He was like, okay, this is, this is good. We're past the visual stage, and I actually talked to you, and I like you. Sometime later, it says he went back to marry her. He turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, which was apparently still there, and he saw it had a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands, and he ate it, and he went along, and he rejoined his parents, and he gave them some, and they ate too. Verse 10, now his father went down to see Uh, the woman, and there Samson held a feast, which was customary for young men. Uh, When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions, okay? Then it says this in verse uh, verse 12. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. And if you can't tell me the answer, you must give me those things. They said, tell us your riddle. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet. So we can probably figure out that he's talking about the lion. For three days, they could not give him an answer. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, now wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us. 
or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Again, a very different time. We're missing a lot of context here. But then they said, did you invite us here to steal our property? There's a lot of cultural context in these verses, which I encourage you again to dive into. But then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, saying, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't even explained to my father or mother, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? And she cried the whole seven days of the feast. It's a tough week. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. Okay? I'm going to leave that where it is. She, in turn, explained the riddle to her people. She betrayed him. But before Sunday, uh, sunset on the seventh day, the men in the town said to him, What's, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, uh, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you have not solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, gave their clothes, and, uh, and then explained the riddle. Burning with anger, so frustrated, he returned to his father's home, away from his wife, away from all of them, away from the situation. And Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had, intended, who had attended the feast as well. Okay, there's a lot of things to unpack here as we kind of follow along and try to understand this wild story. You can see why I, I said it should be on TV. So Samson goes with his parents to meet this girl he wants to marry. He's attacked by a lion. And this is the first time we see this incredible strength that was promised him, that God had given him, uh, that was given by God as God was preparing him to be Israel's deliverer from the Philistines. Uh, and this is where it kind of goes wrong in, in twofold already. First of all, in Samson's uh, dismay, he's love struck kind of at first sight. and He wants to marry this woman he's not supposed to. And he eats the honey from the lion that he killed, breaking his vow as a Nazarite. And as he interacts with something, uh, sorry, as he interacts with something dead, he breaks this vow. And this would be considered culturally and spiritually unclean. So then he throws this party, which was common for the time, thinking about this marriage, this time of transition. Uh, and in translation, this uh, kind of feast that it's talking about actually means a drinking feast, fun fact. Uh, again, it doesn't particularly say he does or doesn't partake in that element, but he's at this party. He puts himself in a bad environment. Then he starts making bets with his boys, right? He's like, you know, if you guys do this, I'll give you clothes. If you do this, I'll give you clothes. And then we begin to see Samson's uh, strength in one moment, but also his flaws. And then there's this paradox of power that happens. It says the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore this lion apart with his bare hands. And Samson's strength was legendary. It was a gift from God to fulfill his mission as Israel's deliverer. But his life was beginning to become marked by these moral failings, impulsiveness, disobedience, and really, honestly, poor judgment. He wants to marry this woman despite his parents' objections and despite God's command to remain separate from these nations. He engages in reckless behavior, pursuing relationships that led him away from God's will instead of into his full calling that God had given him. You see, strength without self-control easily leads to chaos and destruction in our lives. Though Samson was physically strong, he was spiritually and emotionally weak. Two things that are highly important. Think about this for your own life. I know I spent a lot of time thinking about this for myself this week as well. He allowed his passions to dictate his decisions and often uh, acting without considering the consequences. And it made me reflect and think about how many times do I do that? How many times in life have I done that? Proverbs 16 says, Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. Samson's life illustrates the dangers of an unchecked desires and the importance of actually developing self-discipline and not just acting on our impulses. And unfortunately, uh, for Samson, his uh, spiral actually continues as we continue reading this story. I'm going to summarize a little bit because, we, uh, once again, we have three chapters, but I encourage you to go back and read through it this week as you're studying or maybe in your campus group. But Samson, he returns for his wife after this has all happened. He went to be with his parents. He took himself out of the situation, which is probably smart. Then he goes back, and he's stopped by his father-in-law, and he's told, hey, buddy, it's over. She moved on. I don't think it's going to work out. And I mean, probably the best thing for Samson in this moment, and this was, relationship was obviously not a very good one, 
but this enrages our kind of Hulk-like character, Samson. So he goes and he catches 300 foxes, or as the translation actually is closer to jackals at the time, which typically travel in packs of 200 during that time period. Uh, so if you're wondering, how did he catch 300 foxes? It actually checks out. And he attaches torches to them, okay? And then he torches the crops of all and the vineyards of the Philistines. Uh, so very dramatic, uh, you know, kind of payback here. And uh, if you were Samson, I guess you might as well go out in style if you're going to do this. But this caused this kind of chain reaction of the Philistines blaming the father-in-law and Samson's wife. And actually, uh, they went on to, to kill them because of that, which in turn, again, set Samson off, which started this war where Samson ended up clearing out many men. This time it isn't actually numerically written how many, but it's apparently a lot. And then this causes this rift between the Israelites and the Philistines that was already there, but escalated into this big, big issue. And the Israelites, they actually end up handing Samson over to the Philistines, it says. Because they're like, these are our oppressors. Why are you taking these people off? They are technologically smarter than us. They are better coordinated. They have better systems. They have a better government in place. Why are you doing this? And this section ends with Samson, like after this part, actually taking out another thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey carcass, which you should, again, read about because it's pretty awesome and pretty crazy at the same time. But you would think that this is kind of where things end, right? In, the, in our, our story of judges, um, you kind of see the judge, you know, things happen, things are bad. The judge goes to war and they win this battle and then it's kind of like peace for a bunch of years. And that's kind of what you see here, but no. Samson has a bunch more story, wouldn't you know it? In verse 20, it says this, Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Again, it ends similar to other judges where Israel had someone to deliver and lead them, but this one doesn't say X amount of years of peace, okay? Because our guy here, he's not done yet. So flipping over to chapter 16, our final chapter we're going to be looking at, we pick up with Samson going into Gaza, where he stays the night actually with a prostitute. Uh, this theme that he falls in love again with after that with this woman named Delilah. Uh, yes, the famous Delilah that you probably heard about, not the Delilah from that one song. But the Philistines, they still want a piece of Samson, okay? There's been 20 years of this back and forth and this continued dominance over Israel. So they bribe Delilah, again, there's a pattern here, to find out how Samson has this insane strength. Okay, a lot of scholars would say, you know, we paint pictures of Samson, even in the video there, of this, like, huge Hulk guy, like, probably on steroids, like, this massive dude. But it, most scholars actually believe that he was probably unassuming. Because everything within Scripture, it's like, people are like, how is he this strong? How does he do this, these types of things? They, they assume that he was probably a smaller guy with just this incredible strength. So they bribed Delilah to find out how and why. And once again, Samson's poor character discernment on display. Delilah, three times, you can read it there, tries to convince Samson to let her in on the secret. Now, when you read this, it's hard to believe that Samson didn't know something was up. Okay, maybe he's a little blinded by love. I spent a lot of time researching and trying to understand this over the last couple of weeks. And what I think it boils down to is this. One, male stupidity. But two, Samson's complete lack of being able to see past his lust and pick a spouse that actually has his best interest, right? Who has a spouse that has their best interest? Yeah, brownie points, good. But two, the second thing that plagues Samson, I think, throughout this entirety of this story is his ego, okay? When you read it, you, you think about, like, how did you not see this coming, dude? But I actually believe when I read this story and from the research I've done and from the, the, the studies I've read, they believe that uh, Samson, after kind of living this compromised, sinful lifestyle, probably thought, there's no way God's going to take this strength from me. Right? You know, I married a Philistine girl, still strong. Slept with a prostitute, still strong. Messed with a lion carcass, probably drank, still strong. Right? He's doing all these things, and God's not taking away this gift. So you can see his ego being like, well, if I tell her, is it really going to happen? Right? But finally, he tells Delilah that he's pretty sure if he cuts his hair, he's going to lose his strength. But again, we'll see what happens. So in verse 19, it says, Delilah, after putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off his seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. So the Philistines, they finally had their chance. 
And they came and they seized him and they put him in prison. And for good measure, they actually gouged out his eyes to make him blind. Hence my joke at the beginning, but I don't love his blind. It's described that the Philistines, right, were so confident after they had arrested him that they actually left a small young guard to watch over him because they thought this guy, he's nothing. We see here that compromise actually weakens our spiritual foundation. Samson's downfall began way before he actually had his hair cut. He had already compromised his calling by violating other parts of his Nazarite vow and devotion to God, such as touching the dead carcass of a lion and fraternizing with Philistines and sleeping with a prostitute, essentially giving into his flesh and his earthly desires, even though God had given him this great calling and empowerment beyond belief to accomplishment or to accomplish it, sorry. And then and now Compromise often begins with small, seemingly insignificant decisions, doesn't it? But over time, it eventually leads us away from God's will. It leads us away from all that God has called us to be. So finally, Samson, imprisoned, blind, humiliated, hopeless, no more ego, similar to Israel leading up to this point in the book of Judges, cries out to God and prays. Now, we actually don't see Samson pray at all in this story before this moment, which is really interesting. And he may have had supernatural strength for a lot of this story, but no dependence on the mental fortitude that God gives in a difficult life. Samson asked God to restore his strength in this prayer so he could finally fulfill his calling. And it says that God does, and Samson tied to the temple, pulls it down on top of all the Philistines and himself actually ending all of their lives. So we see again in this God's redemption, this strength restored in surrender. And Samson prayed out to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. Samson's story doesn't end in defeat. While in captivity, blind, humiliated, he turned back to God. And his hair actually started to grow again, it says, symbolizing the possibility of restoration. And in his final act, Samson prayed, excuse me, for God's strength one last time. And empowered by the Spirit, he brought down the temple of the Philistines, killing more enemies in his death than he had ever in his life up until this point. His prayer demonstrates repentance and reliance on God, despite his past failures. God answered his prayers and used him to accomplish God's purpose. And this reminds us that no matter how far we've fallen, God's grace is sufficient to redeem us when we turn to him. We're going to continue to worship in a few moments. I'll invite the worship team back up. But following our theme of the book of Judges, that we see this need for an ultimate deliverer in Jesus. There are points in Samson's story that foreshadow Jesus. Both were announced by angels, consecrated to God, empowered by the Spirit. And while Samson was flawed and his deliverance incomplete, Jesus is perfect. He is a sinless Savior who provides ultimate deliverance from sin and death. Samson's story reminds us of our need for a Savior who is greater than any human hero. You know, we do that a lot, don't we? We look to people. We look to leaders. We look to politicians. You think about what's happening in the states right now. We look to this and we make that a religion. We go, this, this is what's going to save us. This person is what's going to save us. But that's not the truth. Where Samson failed, Jesus succeeded. Jesus' sacrificial death and resurrection brought redemption and victory for all who trust in him. So when we attempt to apply these truths to our own story and our own lives, we can see a few things. First, in the beginning, recognize your calling. You are created with a purpose like Samson. You now in 2024, now and then, have been created with a purpose designed by God, and it is crucial to seek God's guidance and relationship and depend on him to understand and fulfill that calling that you have been given here on earth. Samson is an incredible example of unfulfilled potential, and unfortunately for him, that's what he'll be remembered for. Though he did great things for God, it is staggering to consider what he might have done. Each of us is uniquely designed and specifically created 
by God. You know, atheists would have us believe that we're here by accident, but that couldn't be further from the truth. And honestly, I think that's a bit of a cop-out. God cares for you. God loves you. He created you just as he did, uh, created the most incredible lake or ocean or mountain, and his, he has a purpose for your life beyond just existing. Two, but what do we do with that? Well, unlike Samson and his ego, we are to cultivate self-control. No matter how much good God can bring out of even the bad things that we do, right, he can always bring far more good out of our obedience. Amen? Amen. And we ourselves experience much less pain in the process. We can learn from Samson's mistakes to submit our desires and our actions to God, allowing him to guide our decisions. And this story is an interesting case study in God's sovereignty and our human choice and those two things in tension. And we see Samson reap the consequences of his decisions. And I say this because typically we are designed and made for a purpose and we often don't get to choose what that purpose is. Uh, but God made you. He made your personality. He gave you your giftings and he will equip you for the duty that he has called you to. But it takes self-control and discipline to grow into all that God has for us and to rely on him for strength to remain humble in our endeavors and flee from sin and failure that ruins these incredible gifts that God has given us. All over the world right now, we see leaders falling. We see leaders who build themselves up, who, who have this ego or who surround themselves with people who are just telling them how great they are. And we as sinful humans, honestly, most of the time can't handle that. And then we fall because we lack this self-control. We lack these disciplines to say, no, God is the one that has given me these things. God is the one that has given me my position. God is the one that has given me this platform. I remember a pastor growing up, he always told me, he's like, I pray every day that people don't put me on a pedestal because I know if people do that, then God's going to knock me down. And that is absolutely true for pastors. That is absolutely true for every one of us in this room in our own lives. Next, we are called to avoid compromise. So how do we do this? Okay. Stay vigilant in our spiritual lives, avoiding small compromises that can lead to greater disobedience, chaos. And it sounds dramatic, but if you've lived life long enough, you know that these kind of things can lead to destruction and difficulty in our lives. In an extreme example, ask some of the people within our community who may have struggled with a drug addiction just to reference one thing. Most of the time, that ruins a, a person's lives and the lives of their family, and they have to deal with those things sometimes for a very, very long time. And these, these choices that we make, these small compromises that turn into big things, and this isn't what God wants for any of his creation to struggle through these long-term consequences uh, as part of our choices. Two more. First, embrace God's grace. If any of that chaos is your reality or once was, no matter how far you've strayed, remember that God's grace is available to restore you and he wants to use you where you are right now in the lives of pe the people around you and maybe even the lives of the people that have struggled with a similar thing that you have. Lastly, we are to point to Jesus. Let your life reflect the hope and the deliverance found in Jesus, the true and perfect Savior. And this is an incredible gift and not something to hide that we've been given, this incredible grace and hope in the gift of Jesus, far beyond what I think we could actually fathom right now. But the least we can do is live like it and not waste the gift that God has given so to wrap up, the story of Samson is both a warning and a testament to God's faithfulness. It teaches us about the dangers of self-reliance, the consequences of sin, but also the boundless grace of God. Samson's life, though flawed, ultimately points us to Jesus, the ultimate deliverer who redeems us and restores us. And as we reflect on this story, let us commit ourselves to live lives of purpose, obedience, and reliance on God. And may we avoid the pitfalls of compromise and seek the strength that comes from surrendering to him. And above all, may our lives glorify the one true deliverer, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online at Campus Online. And we are so excited to have each and every one of you guys here. If you guys are looking for prayer or to get connected, please reach out. We'd love to connect with you as well. But for now, we will see you later and hopefully we'll see you next week.